Welcome to the National Council of Supervisors of Mathematics, NCSM, Leadership in Mathematics podcast. NCSM is an organization supporting mathematics education leadership at the school, district, college, university, state, province, and national levels. Its membership constitutes an international force collaborating to achieve excellence in mathematics education. Be sure to visit the NCSM website at mathedleadership.org. Welcome to Episode 25 in the series of podcasts recorded at the NCSM Annual Meetings. This talk by President-Elect Diane Breyers was recorded at the 2009 Annual Conference in Washington, D.C. The title of this talk is Intensification, a Comprehensive Approach for Underprepared Algebra Students. One of our greatest challenges as mathematics education leaders is ensuring the success of students who enter high school behind in mathematics. This session describes a comprehensive program that strategically blends effective existing approaches and teaching materials with research informed strategies to increase the performance of underprepared ninth grade algebra students. Ms. Breyers is introduced by Eastern Region One Director Lori Boswell. Be sure to tune in to future episodes of the NCSM Leadership and Mathematics Podcasts. Diane Breyers, certainly uh, I'm sure that many of you know of Diane's past work. I have the privilege of working with Diane on the NCSM board. At the end of this um, meeting, Diane will become the president of NCSM. In addition to that, however, She's a mathematics education consultant and co-director of the Algebra Intensification Project, certainly what we're going to hear about today. She was also a mathematics director for the Pittsburgh Public Schools, and during that time, they made significant progress in increasing student achievement through standards-based curricula, instruction, and assessment. She has served as a member of many national committees, including the National Commission on Mathematics and Science Teaching, for the 21st century that was headed by Senator John Glenn, and in leadership roles for various national organizations, including the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, the College Board, and the National Science Foundation. She earned her PhD in mathematics education, MS, and bachelor's degree in mathematics from Northwestern University, and did postdoctoral study in psychology at the, in the psychology department of Carnegie Mellon University. She did begin her career as a classroom teacher and certainly it's that passion and her devotion to mathematics which has led her further in the study of algebra and what we're going to hear about today. So without further ado, Diane, please. Thank you, Lori. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for your patience. Hopefully we're all set up here. Um, what I am going to be talking to you about today is um, intensification as an approach to algebra, specifically um, addressing the issues described in these next two slides. I'm hoping you can read, you can read them and I don't have to read them to you. This is from Roy Romer. His frustration with algebra and talking about it as the primary source of reasons students drop out of school. And at a closer to the classroom level, a quote from Rich Kaplan, who is an algebra teacher at Evanston Township High School and one of the teachers who's been working on advising on this project. So my assumption is most of you who are here today are here because you have the same concern about algebra and is playing a role in, in the lives of your students in your school district. Um, what I'm going to do today is provide some information about really research informed practices that are guiding the design of a new program for underprepared Algebra One students that I have the privilege of working on with a number of people whose names I'm going to show you. But, but the pro this is not about the program itself per se. What it's really about is some of the um, knowledge I've gained working on this project over the past two years from research in terms of things that are making me rethink the kind of practice I would want to see and the curriculum I would want to see in an Algebra 1 class to support underprepared students. And it's things that 
that even though the program is still under development, and so I'm not going to show you data about its effectiveness, et cetera, et cetera, I think there's some really important practices and principles and ideas that you could make use of now, even without having a comprehensive program to support you. So that's kind of the goal, to give you a flavor of what we're doing, what the research base is, and hopefully you can make use of that, even though a program that would have all these features together in it is not yet available. Here's a description of the project. It's a great partnership, definitely a partnership project. I'm up here talking about it, but it's the work of lots of people. Um, you see the institutions and organizations that are involved. It's an outgrowth of the Urban Math Leadership Network, and here's the districts that are involved in that network. Um, the primary people who are working on actually the design of the project at this point are these individuals. In particular, Jim Lynn from University of Illinois Chicago is really been primary author on this, and if Jim is here, um, we should give him a round of applause at the end, because it's his work, along with that of Kathy Cook at the Dana Center, working with the Agile Mind, Susan Hall, and Marty Gartsman. So this is truly a group effort. We've also had the benefits of a national design team consisting of people from these fields, whose names are too numerous to mention up here, and a wonderful set of teacher co-developers. We have teachers in these four high schools who are actually trying things out as we're developing them giving us feedback, and really helping us stay in touch with the students that we're trying to serve. So keep that in mind. But the content of what this talk is is totally mine, so they're not responsible for any of that. OK, program context. What got us to this? This actually grew out of a need by these urban math leaders saying one of their primary challenges was Algebra 1. As many of you know, we don't have any choice anymore about all students being successful in Algebra 1. But in particular, given that now we have state requirements that say students need to, in fact, be proficient in, in Algebra 2 by the time they take their state test, which is usually in 11th grade, that means you just don't have time not to be successful in Algebra 1 by the end of 9th grade, because you'll never get to Algebra 2 by the end of 11th grade if you don't do that. So we're in this situation of, like, ready or not, here they come, and everybody is being put into, into ninth grade algebra, kids who've been in eighth grade algebra and been unsuccessful, but even those students who are underprepared and have not had a successful middle school experience are now put in the situation where they need to be successful in algebra one. The strategy that many districts are using is what we're, we're just called kind of like this double dosing. I mean, the idea is, and it comes from the standards work that says, okay, we don't want to expend, extend the time that it takes for students to be successful in terms of the number of years. What we need to do is have them reach the same standard. If it's going to take them longer, we need to give them more instructional time within that year. So a lot of districts are doing the double period. We did this in, in Pittsburgh. Um, okay, so kids do assigned of two periods of Algebra one throughout the year. That approach has not necessarily been widely successful. Why? Because we don't have any systematic programs for supporting teachers and students in that double period model. Normally what happens is, oh, you got the kids for two periods, you get the regular algebra program, and good luck, figure out how to do the remediation. Or those of us who try to be a little more thoughtful say, okay, we have our Algebra 1 program, we'll look for supplementary materials that you can pick and choose from. Sometimes we do a lab class, so there's like two different curricula we're trying to put together. And by and large, it has not been, been successful. So what we're trying to do is design what would be a seamless, coherent, comprehensive program to ensure success of really two groups. One, are these underprepared students who are coming to Algebra? who are going to be assigned to this double period class. The other group we're designing for are the teachers of those students. In particular, we know that this, as Katie Haycock so, so eloquently described this morning, it's predominantly the brand new or newer, least experienced teachers who are assigned to teach those double period classes. So this, the, the teachers who have the least experience with high school students and the least experienced with struggling students are put in the classrooms where they have to take a curriculum, an algebra curriculum they're not familiar with, and figure out how to do remediation, even though they're probably less familiar with what would have come before in a middle school curriculum. Much less, they're trying to figure out attendance, discipline, all that other stuff that goes along with being a newbie teacher. So we're very cognizant of the needs of those teachers as well. 
So in the design, it's in intended for both of them. What can we do to support them simultaneously? And finally, we need to go beyond being successful in one or two classrooms or schools. It's got to be something easy enough to use so people can take it to scale. Right? If you're in a, in a district or a state, you know that it's not just enough to work with one or two people. You've got to give wide implementation because, as Katie also described, we want to have systemic support and change, systemic success. So that's the goal. So what we're doing is, yes, we recognize underprepared students need more time. More time alone is just not enough. We've got to do more with it. And so there's all these other pieces that we're going to be putting together. And that's our challenge. How do we put those pieces together? And what does research tell us about how to do those pieces? So that's what I'm going to be elaborating on. And we're doing this trying to look at re research. And I want to clarify, we're looking at research in form. There's two pieces of this. It's instructional practices that we have either solidly demonstrated by research in particular, or that could come from general research on human learning. So we can extend those general principles to mathematics. And we're also trying to build on the best professional judgment of the practitioners. And that's where our co-developers are so important. In essence, we're doing kind of design-based research. So as we're trying things out and seeing how they work, we're getting the opportunity to go back and redesign um, and restructure to be more effective. The kind of thing you're going to see this afternoon, this morning, is also very consistent with the principles that you'll see in Prime, those research-based principles. So as you start seeing some of the things we're citing, the examples we're using, they fit right into the four categories of research-based practices that Prime um, lays out. So to start, two of the research findings that are kind of most solid, that we took very, very seriously, are, are these two. So I'm going to start with the first one, is that we said, you know, even though these are underprepared students, we know where they're going to be more successful if we can engage them in challenging tasks that involve active meeting making. And the research that we're building on here is the research around high cognitive demand tasks that came out of the Quasar project, many of you may be familiar with. If you're not, Quasar was a project in the mid-90s. It was working in middle schools, and they took, went to six urban districts they, in fact, identified the lowest achieving middle school and said, what can we do to increase student achievement with those schools if we actually gave them rich curricula? The important idea that we're building on is looking at the characteristics of mathematical tasks. So as I talk about this part, keep in mind, mathematical tasks is not just one particular isolated question. It could be a set of problems. It could be a single complex problem. The idea is what you engage students in for the purpose of focusing their attention on a particular mathematical idea. Okay, so, so it could be a series of things. And as a contrast, we're going to look at two tasks. The question of why focus on tasks is because, in fact, as Katie also described this morning, what kids get to do has a large part to do with what they have the opportunity to learn, especially in mathematics. It also influences their content because it directs their attention to a particular aspect of content, ways of processing information. And the, the big line is the level and kind of thinking that the mathematical task requires influences what students learn. So just a quick contrast. Two different mathematical tasks. Just take a minute, look at this task, solve it if you like. So this is Martha's carpeting task. Now I'm going to show you a second task, and it's not necessary that you sit and solve it, but what I'm going to ask you to do is compare and contrast the two tasks. Some of you may have seen this before. This is Mrs. Brown's class. So they've got 24 feet of fencing, classic problem. She's got rabbits. They want their rabbits to have as much room as possible in the pen. How long should each side of the pen be? What happens if you only have 16 feet of fencing? And how could you do this for any amount of fencing? So just take a minute, think about those two tasks, and what I'd like you to do is talk to the person sitting next to you about those two tasks, and the question to you is, how are they the same, and how are they different? Okay, so in your discussions, what's similar about these two tasks? Somebody just want to share what some of the things they came up with? What's similar? Okay, they both involve area. Anything else similar? They both involve a context. Anything else? Okay. How are these tasks different from each other? For the 
higher level, blue set on the higher level. Okay, so you're saying that, that the second task is higher level than the first task. Why? What, what's, the, what's the difference? Generalization, analyzation, work is known. Okay, so the fencing task required generalization and you said? And you have analogs. Okay, analysis and generalization. And what did the, the uh, Martha's carpeting task require? Just computation knowledge. Okay, basic computation, okay. Anyone else have something in terms of their differences? Yes. The second one connects two concepts, the concept of perimeter the second one connects two concepts, con the concept of perimeter and the concept of area. Okay. Anything else? The second one had more rigor in it. Say a little bit more about that. Well, in average, they have to apply it beyond just what they know about area. If, if, they, if they know that they can form mm -hmm. different perimeters using uh, the same dimension, but you know what, not the same dimension, but the same, the same area with, with different dimensions. That, that you have the same, the fixed perimeter, and you get different areas right. from that, that fixed perimeter. And in fact, um, I was doing this once with, with David, uh, some of you know David Foster from California, and he was in the group, and his claim was, you know, Martha, the fencing task isn't really about area and perimeter at all. It's about optimization. It's a whole different you know, different level of thinking in terms of mathematics. This is an illustration of kind of what would be differences between cognitive tasks. That the Quasar project identified what's called lower level cognitive demand tasks, it's things that involve solely memorization, okay? like which digit in a particular number is in the tens place, or what they call procedures without connections. Okay, which is like the Martha's carpeting task. You just have this procedure, you do it, you're done. Right? They also then identified at the other end higher level tasks, which are procedures with connections. So you may have to explain how a procedure works, represent something in two different ways, um, or tasks that actually involve what they call doing mathematics, where you're actually generalizing, reaching some conclusion, and extending something like the fencing task. And what they what they found is that, in fact, when students had the opportunity to engage in higher level tasks, there was higher levels of achievement. That doesn't mean there should never be lower level tasks, but in fact, students need to be able to engage in higher level tasks as they're doing their mathematics. So as we went through to design the algebra course, we said one of the things we need to then do is consistently build in higher kind of demand tasks and sometimes those things are higher cognitive demand tasks if they're tasks that are unfamiliar to students and they need to be able to struggle with those tasks before we show them the solution methods. So just as examples, and these are tasks you call the kinds of things you've seen before, when we start and do something around systems of equations, before we actually start to do solution methods, we want to engage students in thinking about a systems problem but let them figure it out via their own devices first. We know that they've done enough in terms of representing situations, et cetera, so they do have some, a, like a toolkit of, of strategies to use. So they've done graphing, they've done tables, so we're not just setting them loose with no background. So they're gonna be doing tasks like this, and then we're also doing kind of more extended problems that you've seen in other contexts as well, algebraic thinking problems like consecutive sums problems, so they have a chance to engage in things that are even more like um, the fencing task where you're actually generalizing. This is the example where you've got um, sums of consecutive numbers, and then what students are asked to do is investigate different sums of consecutive numbers and um, see what they can discover about the sums. So this has been a big piece as we think about what our algebra core should be. Things that have guided us are first, we really do need to have time to, to take the time to do those challenging high cognitive demand tasks for students. Second, we do work very hard at a balance among conceptual knowledge, skills, and problem solving. So after we engage in those high cognitive demand tasks, we still need to get to a point where we discuss it, make the mathematics visible, and then there's intentional learning and there's going to be practice because it's important that kids become automatic in some of these skills. We can't just keep doing big tasks and not actually build in the practice that 
that give them the kind of facility to um, be successful. And then we've also been augmenting this with technology-based representations that help kids actually see the links. And our core partner in this work is the Agile Mind Online Services. And so a lot of our lessons, after students engage in it, we get to see solutions that also come to life using technology animations. Um, and I know the Agile Mind group has some sessions here, so you can get to see more about that particular program. But the idea is we're trying to help kids make those connections and engage them in those high cognitive demand tasks. So that's kind of number one. Number two, it turns out that, again, this is extending on the uh, Quasar research, that just having those high cognitive demand tasks is not sufficient. Is this an example of actually a, high, a, a task from um, an elementary program, kindergarten program? Many of you have seen this. This is graphing dice throws. Okay? It's a task where you've got kids working in partners, let's think kindergartners, first graders. They each have a die. They roll the die. See what the sum is, and then what they're supposed to do is graph the sum. Okay? So they roll the die again, graph the sum, and then what they do is they continue to do this until one number wins. Right? What number is going to get to the top first? And the way you do the activity is each partner, each partnership does this. We usually ask the kids to predict first which number do you think is going to win. The kids all go through and, and graph. And then when they finish their graphs, you all put them up and you look at the graphs and say, what do you notice? And what do you think they notice? Seven, seven. Right? Oh my gosh. Like six, eight, nine, they always win. You know, two never won. You know, why is that? And then you can see what the mathematics discussion is around that in terms of why that might happen, um, combinations, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So, in Pittsburgh, we did professional development after school. So I was sitting in a kindergarten professional development session after school, sitting next to a kindergarten teacher who was, and the, the group was discussing this activity. So she's sitting next to me and she goes, you know, I love this curriculum. My kids love this curriculum. We love this, but my children are low level. So I did the activity. <laughs> Some of you are like laughing, but like, oh. It's so sad. Because, because what happened when she changed from one, two die to one die? She took away the mathematics and lowered, lowered the cognitive demand. Now, I want to be real clear about this. In, in terms of reflection on this, I want you to think about this. Here was a teacher who was at after-school professional development. She was actively trying to do the curriculum she was given, liking it, enjoying it, and trying to do the activities. She was concerned about her children being able to do the task, because you know our job as teachers is to make things easy for the kids. We don't want them to struggle. We don't want them to work too hard, you know, because we want them to be successful. And so she did the tried and true thing in mathematics that we typically do, which is let's simplify the task. And she simplified it the easiest way she knew, which was, in fact, let's reduce the number of die. We'll make it only one. What we know is this is very typically what happens in a mathematics class, that, in fact, it's very difficult to implement programs, to implement tasks and keep their level high. Um, and think about the fencing task. For those of you who go and observe classes, how often have you gone into a classroom and they have a task like the fencing task, and what does the teacher do? Class, let's think about this together. Where should we start? Oh, you think we should start with a rectangle? Now, let's think. What kind of rectangles would have a perimeter of 24? Let's make a list, right? I mean, who's doing the thinking? What happened to the cognitive man? So it's much more typical than you, than you think. Um, so the message here is, as the, from the Quasar research, is that in fact it's not just the tasks that we put in the program, it's in fact how the tasks are set up by teachers, how the tasks are implemented by students that really makes a difference in student learning. And if you're familiar at all with the TIMS research, 
You also know that, in fact, in US classrooms, what we typically do is take high cognitive demand tasks and reduce their demand. So our challenge in actually putting high cognitive demand tasks in the curriculum is not just putting them in there. The question is, how can we support teachers in their implementation of those tasks? And so what we've really tried to do is say, how can we take responsibility as developers for those supports? And so what we've been trying to do is say, OK, if there's questions that teachers should be asking, things they should be doing to, in fact, help kids engage and keep the cognitive demand high, we shouldn't rely on teachers to try to figure this out on their own. Okay, that's not saying we're setting low expectations for teachers, but we're saying especially brand new people, people who haven't done this before, if they're, why are we keeping that a secret? And so what we're doing is, first of all, trying to embed that actually in the student materials. It's not just enough to put it in the teacher materials. If there's a question we want kids to think about, why not put it right in the materials? Make it really explicit for students. Also, really working on a partner model. So kids are working together. Notice partners, not in groups. Two reasons. One, groups are harder to manage than partners. But second, groups give kids places to hide that partnerships don't. So in partnerships, kids can ask each other questions and discuss things and are more likely to engage, keep the cognitive demand high. And then we do try to put other supports for teachers in the teacher guide, which is things like other likely student responses, what you should look for. So to really try to provide all the supports that makes it possible to keep that cognitive demand high. So there's the two pieces for that. So that's number one, that's cognitive demand. Another major thing we know from research is the importance of connecting new learning with prior knowledge. I mean, we say that a lot. Um, as an example of the importance of this, I'm going to actually use a literacy example because the math examples are too hard to use in this group. So what I'm going to do is, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a little paragraph. I want you to read it, and I want you to tell me what it's about. Or tell the person next to you what it's about, because I won't be able to hear all of you. Okay? Anybody think they know what this is about? Yeah. Flying a kite. What do you think? So for those of you who had trouble thinking about figuring out what this was about, would it have been easier if I would have done that before I had to do the <laughs> Really kind of helps, right? So the interesting thing about connecting new knowledge with prior knowledge, it's not just whether you have the prior knowledge or not. It's the extent to which I actually make it clear that <coughs> now is the time you should think about that prior knowledge and use it. Right? Really help access that prior knowledge and bring it to the bear. So that's a second really important principle that we've been working with, is how do we, in fact, think about ensuring students have that prior knowledge and help them access that prior knowledge at the appropriate time and connect it to the new learning. So we're being, trying to be very strategic about that. So as an example, we do this, we do something where we try to talk about previewing. If we know something's going to be needed <coughs> in, um, and let's, let's take again the unit on systems of equations. So we know we're going to want to do something with substitution. That means kids need to have some experience with substitution before we get to using it to solve linear equations. That would be nice. And when we actually get there, we want to make sure that we let them know it's going to be help helpful. And we do that in a couple different ways. Um, one thing we do is the things I bet lots of you do, which is like lesson warm-ups or openers or like the bell activities when the kids walk in. What we've decided to do, instead of using those openers as just like practice or random problems we stick up on the board as we think of as we walk into the classroom and let's write something down so the kids are busy, We've tried to be very intentional to say what, in fact, will kids actually need to access in this lesson that, in fact, will help them make those connections. So for example, give you some sense of this. Day one of the program, you're the, you walk into Algebra 1 the first day, one of the things you're going to do are these things uh, called shape equations. They've been around in lots of different contexts. 
But we wanted kids to engage in this, and the idea here is to figure out what number each of these shapes represents. If you take a method to solve it, you know, you can, and we ask them kind of what kind of thinking they had to use to do this. Does everybody have enough time to solve it? Because I know if I go on and you didn't, you'll be upset. Okay. All right. So, and, and we keep doing that, right? We have them built in and we practice these. So it's not just you see it day one and you never see it again. You get to see them on kind of like an ongoing basis. But then when we get to, to um, the systems unit and we know the day we're going to start talking about substitution, the opener for that day, you can read it, says, first of all, we actually do something that's evaluated. So it's considering the consider the following algebra problems in earlier the course, evaluate, um, the product AB plus 2C, when A equals negative 2, B equals negative 3, and C equals 5. They solve the problem, but then we're asked <coughs> to explain how the mathematical idea of substitution is used in the problem. So we're kind of cueing that right in. And then we give them another set of shape equations, and we ask them again, how did you figure it out? How do you know your answer is correct? And then how does the idea of substitution come in? So we've talked about substitution in this other context, we're going to cue it in and make sure they know because next thing they're going to be looking at then are systems and let them play around with some systems and try to figure out what to do. We'll see how many people actually use that. So this is an example of what we're trying to do. Another big thing about accessing prior knowledge is that in fact sometimes it's imperfect. In fact, there's a reason why these are underprepared students, right? Um, the interesting thing in thinking about underprepared students, and this comes from the work of Malcolm Swan, um, and people at the Shell Center, is that we shouldn't assume that because students are underprepared, they're coming as blank slates. In fact, they've learned a lot of things in elementary and middle school. The problem is, it just may not be quite right. And we also shouldn't assume it's totally wrong. Right? They have some things they know and are able to do. So as we're thinking about addressing kind of the remediation question, the approach is, Let's expose and discuss those common misconceptions and errors. Instead of assuming let's starting from scratch and totally reteach. So as an example, graphing. Right, think about here's a table of values. Let's say we want, think about your underprepared kids and they're going to graph that. If any of you can't see it, the ordered pairs are 1, 1, 4, 7, 6, 11, and 7, 3. And notice how they're ordered in, in the table. If we ask underprepared or some kind of struggling students to graph it, what are they likely to do? So what if you, I don't know if you can see along the, what the student actually did. The, what is it? The scale. What's the matter with the scale? It's, the scale is not consistent, okay? which is a real problem that we get with a lot of kids that are just not thinking about making consistent scales. So one way to get kids to think about that is actually in something we explicitly ask kids to do is let's, let's tell them it's wrong and let's ask them to figure it out. So it's not just letting them make the mistake and then trying to correct it individually, but with your partner, and there'll be a whole set of things you would want to do, let's analyze these graphs, what's wrong with the graphs, and then what was the mistake. So it's this idea of through this discussion, you're actually going to be analyzing and um, coming up with those misconceptions. So we do it in a whole range of, of things. This is just a simple example. But again, it's having the kids actually focus on it. So this kind of, uh, these, to incorporate these principles, one of the things we did, and keep in mind, we've got 80 minutes, right? It's a double period, is a lesson structure that allows us to um, do something with the opener, some core algebra activities, um, and then we have, during the second half of a period, something we call consolidation activities. So it's the second part of every day, kind of, where we're going to do things like, let's address these misconceptions. Let's have activities that are going to confront that. So another thing that this program builds on is students' motivation, motivation issues, and perception of their own knowledge that, in fact, was highlighted in the National Math Panel Report. This is the research of Carol Dweck. And the work we're building on here is directly work, development work that Agile Mind has done in terms of developing instructional materials for this. So the big idea behind this research is that students' belief about their intelligence affect their academic achievement. And in a nutshell, what Dweck and her colleagues have identified is there's two ways to think about your intelligence. Some kids think that intelligence is fixed. 
right? I either have it or I don't, and the amount I have is what I will always have. That's it. Um, and of kids who think that, and this goes for kids who think, I might not have a lot, but it also applies to kids who think, you know, I'm really smart. I'm one of those people who really got it. I have it. Kids who have those mindsets avoid, first of all, situations in which they might make mistakes. Because if I don't think I'm very smart, I don't want to make a mistake because it just reinforces I'm not very smart. But if I ever think I'm really smart, I don't want to be in a situation where I'm going to make a mistake because, you know, that makes me I'm not very smart. So, um, so what they do is they try to hide rather than fix mistakes or deficiencies or understanding. And in fact, when they're confronted with a challenge, like algebra, what students with this kind of mindset do is they shut down. In contrast, Dweck's group has identified something called a growth mindset. And a growth mindset, you believe that in fact, your success depends on hard work and effort. And you can become smarter if you work hard at something. And those, when students have that kind of a mindset, they do work to correct their mistakes. They view effort as positive. If I don't do it the first time, I can do it the next time, etc. The wonderful thing about this is that, in fact, this view of intelligence can be affected with instruction. I mean, it'd be one thing if you said, oh, kids have these mindsets and you can't change it. But what Dweck's work has also shown is that when you, in fact, give kids explicit instruction about the brain, how your brain works, that you can build more connections and get smarter, and you give kids success experiences to help modify that and, and support that, then, in fact, you can change kids' opinions of themselves. And, in fact, the kind of effort that they're able to put forth. Because the whole idea is the them to work hard and to actually get them to think that it's going to pay off. Now, as I said, there's um, Agile Mind has worked on developing a whole instructional program around this, so there's some actual instructional materials around this, but even more immediately, there's some research results that we can all take away with us. And one of them is that teacher praise influences the mindsets that students develop. And I thought this was fascinating. I wish I would have known this years ago. And that is that teachers encourage students to develop a fixed mindset about their intelligence when they use praise that refers to how smart kids are. Steve, you did great on that. You're really smart. Versus, Steve, you did really great on that. You worked really hard. Or, you know, Karen, you didn't quite get that, but I know you worked really hard at it, and I know you'll be able to do it the next time. So it's this idea of where you're going to, how teachers do praise, and what the implications, what the impact it has on kids. And this goes all the way back, not just in high school, but think about the kindergarten teachers, first grade teachers. Think about what parents say to their kids in terms of how they, in fact, what kind of mindset they're promoting all through students' development. Okay. So there's that piece we're trying to incorporate in. This is a moldy oldie. We all know about this, right? Ongoing review and practice helps. So we've taken this very seriously as well. And if you teach elementary, we kind of went, kind of said, you know, we can do this in high school too. And what we're going to do, though, is be very intentional about our ongoing review and practice. So that, and what I mean by intentional, think about our underprepared algebra kids. Our intention is, what do we need to review and practice? Well, first of all, we said, you know, we need to review and practice some of those things that kids did learn in middle school. That helps us identify holes, but also think about those things kids did in eighth grade and seventh grade around geometry and measurement and all those things we don't want them to forget, because they're, especially because they're going to need it in, that, in geometry class. So we're going to build in things about that. We also want to keep ongoing review and practice of things we've already developed and established in our high school program, in the Algebra One program. And last but not least, we want to be previewing those things that we're going to need. So in fact, kids are going to be able to do this when they get there in the course. So we built, there's a systematic model for that. And that's what we call our staying sharps in terms of every day, there are six of those things that they keep cycling through and practicing and practicing, designed very intentionally. OK, moving right along. This is one of my favorite Peanuts cartoons. Uh, Peppermint Patty saying, yes, ma'am, I understand you want more than just the math answer. You want me to explain how I got the answer? I copied it from the kid behind me. Part 
what we also do is we want to be really explicit with students about the expectation. So clear expectations with students about the tasks they're going to do, about their work, about the quality of the work. So early on, what we're having kids talk about is when have they been successful working with a partner? What are the criteria for working with a partner? When you're going to get up and share your work, we want you to do a poster and share your work or do it on the transparency. What kinds of things should we see there? If you're going to get up and present, what are the criteria for a good presentation? So we want to be very explicit and clear about those kind of criteria from day one. So kids know what's expected. And we take the time to do that. Uh, this is another moldy oldie cartoon, but still one of my favorites. I taught Stripe how to whistle. That's the dog. I don't hear him whistling. I said I taught him. I didn't say he learned it. It's real attention to assessment and the distinction between assessment for learning and assessment of learning. I know many of you are familiar with this concept, Black and William talking about the importance of formative <coughs> assessment and that we're assessing and diagnosing. But the key part of that is that students are getting feedback. So we've been very intentional about the kind of feedback that students are getting. And then the evidence is actually used to adapt teaching. So the formative assessment strategies, we're trying to build in effective classroom discussions, questions, specific activities that enables teachers to get information from students. We're trying to, in fact, help teachers analyze the evidence to determine what an appropriate intervention would be. And this notion of feedback that's going to help students move their learning forward and take responsibility for their own learning. So we've also been very intentional about how we want kids to, in fact, and teachers to address assessments, not just take them and turn them in. This is also one of my favorite cartoons. There's no such thing as a wrong answer. However, if there were such a thing, Malcolm, that certainly would have been it. <laughs> so we need better feedback than that. <laughs> so feedback to students, we want it to have these characteristics. And so what we've done in the program is we're actually trying to, divine, to design processes that help students take responsibility for assessing their own learning and understanding and also getting feedback from teachers. So um, this is actually Jim Lynn's creation. Uh, it's a homework processing routine and it's also though an assessment processing routine. So when we give assessments, students use a similar process. Where what we want kids to do first before, this is in the homework, after they've done it, we want kids to process homework. We're not going to take time as a whole class to go over. We want kids to have some responsibility for that processing. Um, so kids get to t talk to each other with your partner. Did you both get the same answer? If not, if you're in disagreement, have some discussion about what you might have done wrong. Did you both use the same approach? If you were going to explain the problem, could you explain it if you were asked to do so? Because we might talk about one or two problems depending what's there. Then we want each student to do something reflective, to give some indication, it doesn't have to be what's listed, about how well do I understand what I did. Um, and if, if you can now correct the problems that you got wrong, great, because I want to know that. When we do assessments, what we're encouraging teachers to do is look over the assessments, but give kids written feedback and comments before doing grades. Don't go in and mark them right or wrong. It might be a question you'd ask students so they can go back and compare with their partner and then make some corrections and then turn it in to get graded. The important thing is not when a student can get it right, it's that they understand it and can do it ultimately. So we're really trying to change that, that grading practice. So in a nutshell, what we're trying to do in the program, just to recap, is incorporate these design features in, at least the ones I've been able to have time to talk about, in a way that would be comprehensive. I should say, we're not developing this at all from scratch. You heard me mention Agile Mind. We're building on their existing program. We're also looking at all the good work that other people have done and the research they've done in terms of effective remediation programs. But take these design tool features together and build them into a program that will promote student success. Hopefully, by highlighting some of the research and what those principles are, that will give you something to think about immediately when you go back and think about how would I want to support teachers who are teaching these programs under prepared students so that, um, in fact, even students now who are in double period algebra, whatever, 
can be more successful in those programs, even if they're coming in underprepared. So thank you very much for your attention this morning. Have a good time.